Well, folks, once again, we are joined by Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist and Science Fellow for Nutrient Ag Solutions. Eric, I'm a little bit excited the last couple of days when we finally got out of those heat advisories uh, that was pretty much rolling through the Midwest, but it kind of seems like those are coming back and that's definitely going to be the highlight of what we're going to talk about today. Can you kind of give us an update on specifically the La Nina weather pattern that, you know, just does not seem to want to go away? Yeah, you know, so so you're right. We had the heat advisories that started in the plains. They moved into the Midwest and they're trying to move out of the Mid-South into the Southeast now, but it's going to come back like the, the pattern's going to come back. And a lot of that's because of what's going on with La Nina. So let me let me just show you what we've seen with this La Nina. So our first map here is current ocean temperatures. And when we talk about La Nina, it's this cool water that's in through here and it's largely driven on stronger trade winds. Now, if, if we would have been talking all winter long, uh, this would have been a situation where I would have thought by now we would have lost the influence of this La Nina because normally as we go into summer, La Nina's influence fades a little bit. Let me show you how bad the forecast was. I mean, that's it's important to look at that, and this is how bad it was. So this is a neat graphic. Uh, when you look at this, the zero line is average ocean temperature. Below it, we would generally consider La Nina, and above it would be El Nino. Now, I'm taking you back to February when this forecast was released, and the red lines were where we thought the La Nina would go over the coming months, so into July. We thought we'd be up here in neutral territory. The dash lines would actually happen, which means we all, when looking at this, overestimated the kind of the drop off of La Nina conditions. And what that means is we now still very much have a base state La Nina flow in the atmosphere. And you may say, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, in addition to the trade winds being strong, it means that the jet stream is going to do more of what you see right here, breaking up into bigger and more highly amplified loops like the large ridge that's gonna be pushing in here into the central United States. Uh, we're gonna get another one of these this weekend and more importantly, these deeper troughs that form off of the West Coast. And why you care about it is because whatever typically happens here, we get the opposite of it in the midsection of the United States. So maybe it's easier just to look at it in terms of history. So what I've got here is what we call the composite trough ridge pattern for recent La Nina events for June and July. So I, I grabbed the years, they're right down here, you can see them. When you stitch them all together, we favor more troughing here with ridges on either side, like one just south of the Aleutian Islands, north of Hawaii, and another one that tends to anchor somewhere in the midsection of the country with possible blocking down, down, down range, um, you know, between Canada and Greenland. And what this is, we call this the triple ridge pattern, one, two, and three, and it just tends to give us risk for drought expansion. And we got a new drought monitor this morning. And we're gonna have to focus a lot on this going forward. Uh, I actually live in this little spot uh, right here that's now had abnormally dry conditions show up. Now you may be saying, okay, what's the big deal? Cause I'm looking over here. Well, it's interesting. I, I've had um, a huge truck driving through my yard taking out 80 yards of dirt in the back. He's driven over the same spots out in my front yard now about 35 times and there are no ruts. That's how dry the topsoil is just in this one spot right here. What's got me concerned is just this morning here on the 16th, the uh, CPC, the Climate Prediction Center, just issued their newest seasonal drought outlook, and that's from June 16 to September 30. And now you can see this new area in through here where they're expecting drought to develop. And that's got a lot of us concerned because it's not just here, but it's in Iowa, at the Western Plains, where it's going to be persistent. Places where it's going to improve are the East Coast and in the Southwest where the monsoon's going to get going. Now, what I think is going to happen with this pattern is we might see a lot more of what we've seen over the last three days. And that's the map you're looking at here. It's showing you precipitation compared to normal. And you notice how the storm trajectory kind of keeps coming up and over like this, comes up and over. Those are ridge riding storm events, and they kind of curl back around into the southeast. Question is, how much do they avoid in this area? I'm going to tell you one thing about this pattern that's got me most concerned, okay? If you're a Midwestern farmer, you need to be watching the Mid-South. If this particular area goes over dry, we just can't seem to bring moisture back into this region and it gets drier and drier, then as the moisture later in the season comes up out of the Gulf, this region steals it before it gets in to the primary corn and soybean belt. So I will be watching this area very, very carefully as we press forward. Now, lately we've seen a lot of severe weather as well, right? The beginning of June has just We've had major hailstorms out in the plains. We had the derecho event that went right in through here earlier this week on Monday, producing almost 600 reports of severe weather. 
But when you back that out, not just look at the severe weather, but who got the precip and who didn't, this map tells the story a little bit better. So look at this one carefully. In fact, what I want you to look at is the red spots. These are the folks that have been getting leapfrogged by the storm systems. So those are the places that are going into drought faster than others. And there's a big section here in parts of Nebraska and Iowa. Look at Missouri, Illinois, pockets of Indiana, then in the Southeast, all the way down to Texas. And don't forget about this corner up here in Minnesota. We have to watch those areas carefully. And the reason why it comes back to that jet stream pattern. So if you look at this here, watch as I play this forward. The jet stream continues to show big ridges in place like this. It continues to break apart through the end of June, more ridging in place there, and that brings on the warm temperatures. This is a five day sliding window. And as I just play this out here through the third week and fourth week of June, you notice that the West stays cool and the central United States stays warmer. And that's how you arrive at this temperature, or excuse me, this precipitation pattern, which again, if you're inside of this area that's showing up drier, what we're going to be watching for is the southwest monsoon sending ridge riders over the top, but inside here it's going to be mainly isolated convective storm events that we can get under the heat of the day. So that's it. That is that's everything I'm watching in a nutshell in the next 15 days. Yeah, and even just talking about that heat, I was talking to my neighbor yesterday and they had some late planted corn that they were, you know, it, it was a little bit later than what they from when they first started, but the growing degree units just really helped that pop up especially for trying to get that back on track. And it just seems like, you know, the amount of precipitation that they've gotten in Iowa and then the heat has really helped that, but kind of moving forward to the long range on how that might persist and where that could actually start to do some damage. Right. And I, I had some happy Iowans yesterday because the storms rolled through, brought in the rain, they had the heat. Come to Illinois, our corn was all rolled up tight yesterday in most of the states. So we wish we were getting those storms in this area. So if we take you from the next 15 days and then stretch it out beyond that, like how about we go from, from uh, late June, June 25th to July 25th, there's not a single model out there that's trying to break it down. And I'm concerned about that. Now, I know that the skill in these models is not high. They, they, they actually have low skill scores. But we're concerned that they may be accurate this year, even though historically they don't have good skill. And what it's going to take is, do we just continue to get those troughs that show up here with ridging events in the midsection of the country? If that happens, you have regional drought development in some of the best farmland on the face of the earth. That is still a possibility. Does the heat stress go away? The model suggests that it, it doesn't, that it's there more often than not. But I, I want to be very clear here. I'm not predicting disaster. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at it saying there is risk and those places that have missed out lately, this again, this map, those red regions, they're going to be at risk first, but it is a long growing season and late July and August rains can cure a lot of problems, can't they? So we, we don't yet know if we're going to be able to just revive the crop at a later date. It's the near term stress that I'm concerned about. And one last thing to show you, this was just released this morning. Let's blow this up so we can see it. This is the new uh, July outlook from the CPC. So we've now got favoring above average temperatures across a broad section of the country. And look at where they've gone over dry. It's like right in the middle. It's in the heartland. And their three month outlook now looks like that. So this is now July, August and September that they're uh, that they're looking at these issues here. So we've, we've got a lot of things on our plate in terms of potential risk versus near term risk which means every time we talk, we're going to have a lot to be discussing and telling folks about. I mean, last year we were facing, people were saying it was devastating with what we saw. And then I was having the, with that same neighbor yesterday, we were having that conversation where it's like, Iowa still ended up with some of the best bushels that we've ever seen. And so we're kind of hoping that that, at least with these near-term rests, that that can still happen again. And to where we're not seeing a lot of corn rolling in late stages and not recovering, especially. Yeah, I mean, last year, so Iowa, the whole Western Corn Belt smoked out hot and dry until August. Mm -hmm. And then it rained like mad. And all of a sudden that crop just came back with a vengeance. And I had people that were asking me if their yields were going to be lower than 2012. And then they set new records. So it's amazing what the corn plant can do and what soybeans can do now. But we just say, what if that rain didn't come? What would the yields have been? And so we're asking that question again this year. Because even though we've gotten off to a good start, the risk is still there on the table moving forward. Right. And definitely, like you said, that's a lot of stuff that we're going to hopefully be talking about each week and trying to really pinpoint 
you know, what's changing, what's not changing, and just bringing about that forecast looking forward to through the summer. But once again, thank you, Eric. You bet.